Calorimetry is the measurement of heat that is either released or absorbed during a reaction. When two different objects at different temperatures are placed in contact, heat flows from the material at higher temperature to the material at lower temperature. Heat flows until both materials reach the same final temperature. The amount of heat energy lost by the hot material equals the amount of heat energy gained by the cold material. So if a block of metal at 55 degrees C is placed into some water at 25 degrees C, then the thermal energy is going to transfer from the metal to the water because the metal is at a higher temperature than the water. The exact temperature change depends on the following. So we saw in an earlier section that we can calculate the heat of um, an object or the heat of a process if we know the mass and the specific heat and the change in temperature. So Q equals M times C times delta T. So um, to determine exactly what the final temperature of the water would be in this example, we would know, need to know the mass of both objects, we would need to know the specific heat of both objects, and we would need to know the temperature change of both objects. So um, when a 150 gram lump of hot iron at 537 degrees Celsius is placed into 200 mils of water at 25 degrees C, the temperature increases. What is the final temperature of the water? So um, we can calculate the heat of the iron if we know the mass of the iron and the heat capacity of the iron and the temperature change of the iron. I can also calculate when I place the, this hot iron, this lump of hot iron into water, the water is going to absorb that heat. So I can, absor I can measure the heat of the water, the heat that the water absorbs. If I know the mass of the water, the specific heat of the water and the heat or the excuse me the temperature change of the water where it starts and where it ends so in a problem like this when I'm putting two different materials in contact with each other at different temperatures and heat is going to transfer from the hot object into the cold object then I kind of have a situation like this where I can calculate the heat of either object using the equation we've seen before, Q equals MC delta T. When I put hot iron into cold water and the heat transfers from the iron to the water, the amount of heat that the iron loses is exactly equal to the amount of heat that the water gains. So we can say that the iron is going to lose heat negative Q. It's going to lose heat. The amount of heat that the iron loses is exactly the same as the amount of heat that the water gains. That's because if we think about this, I have some hot metal in water and when I place the hot metal in there, if the water is going to heat up, the water heating up, the temperature change of that water is solely dependent on that, the heat that's coming from the hot metal. So if the metal is going to lose heat when it goes into the water, where does the heat from the iron go? It goes into the water, so the water gains that heat. So these two quantities, the amount of heat the iron loses and the amount of heat the water gains are exactly the same. So what that means is that the mass of the iron times the heat capacity of iron times t the temperature change of iron equals the mass of the water times the heat capacity of the water times the temperature change of the water. So if I have 
the heat that the iron loses is equal to the heat that the water gains then I know that the mass Q equals the mass of the iron I'm just going to write M Q equals the mass of the iron times the heat capacity of the iron times delta T of the iron. I'm going to put this negative sign out front because of the negative sign that was out front here. Equals the mass of the water times heat capacity of water times the temperature change of the water. So the question's asking, what's the final temperature of water? So let's expand this a little bit more. Mass of iron times C of iron times delta T. Remember, delta T is really T F minus T I. And we can say the same thing over on this side. That delta T is really T F minus T I. So the question's asking, what is the final temperature? But I'm I have two T F's here and I have two T I's. So this is the initial temperature of iron. So if we go back and see what our what the question says says the initial temperature of, wa of iron is 537 degrees C. That's how hot it is before it goes in. So the initial temperature of iron is 537 degrees C. The initial temperature of water is 25 degrees C, according to our question. So which final temperature am I looking for? The final temperature of water or the final temperature of the iron? Well, remember at equilibrium, when all the heat is done transferring from the iron into the water, what will be true is that both of those objects will be at the same temperature. So Tf is the same. Tf for water and Tf for iron is the same. And in fact, after we complete the math for this problem, we will only solve for one Tf. Both of these variables are going to be combined into one variable at the end. So let's plug in the information that we are given from the question. We have 150 grams of iron at 537 degrees C. And I look up on uh, Google that this heat capacity of iron is 0.444 joules per gram per degree C. So if we put this information in, the mass of iron, 150 grams times the heat capacity of iron 0 0.444 joules per gram per degree C times T F minus T I the initial temperature is 537 degrees C All right, the mass of water, I started off with 200 mils of water. And my problem says that there's one gram per mil. So that means I have 200 grams of water. That's how we use the density in a problem like this. When we're given the volume of water and not the mass, then I need to have the volume of water and the density of, of water or the density of that solution so that I can calculate the mass. Because in these heat problems, it doesn't matter what the volume is. It doesn't matter how many moles I have. It matters what the mass is. How much does it weigh? So the mass of water times the heat capacity of water, 4.184 joules per gram per degree C. Tf, we don't know, it's what we're trying to solve for, minus the initial temperature of water, 25 degrees C.
So the variable that I'm trying to solve for in this equation is TF. I still haven't dealt with this negative sign out front. So let's deal with that now. I'm going to get rid of this down here. If I deal with this negative sign out front, then um, I'm going to have to bring that in and apply it to one of these variables. So I can, whenever I think about these equations, it helps me to think about them conceptually and as what they mean. So I could just say, put the negative right here at the beginning, negative 150, that's fine. Or negative 0 0.444, that's fine. Or bring the negative over here. It doesn't matter mathematically which of these I distribute the negative sign to. But if I am bringing this negative in um, and I'm thinking about this conceptually, there's no such thing as negative mass, so I don't want to have negative m necessarily. Negative c, I'm not, don't have the reverse of the heat capacity. The heat capacity of iron is the same. The reason that there's a negative here, remember, is because negative heat means that I'm releasing heat, and on this side, plus q means that the water is gaining heat. Losing heat, negative. Gaining heat, positive. So if something is losing heat, then really what's happening is the, the temperature, I start at a high temperature and I go to a low temperature. So if I'm going to apply this negative sign to one of these variables, it makes sense to bring it over here. And so the way that we're going to flip these around is by uh, just fl literally flipping them around. 537 degrees C minus T F. So then I've distributed this negative sign to the inside. All right, now I have 150 grams times 0.444. I didn't change these numbers. So on this side, I haven't changed anything yet. Let's just, it always is a good idea when you're doing a complicated math equation to go one step at a time so you don't get ahead of yourself. And so if you make a mistake, it's easy to go back and check what you did in that one step. You need to go step by step. So what we did in this last step was just to uh, distribute this negative sign into the parentheses. So to do that, I flipped these around. So negative times TF is negative TF. Negative times negative 537 is positive 537. So if I get negative TF plus 537, that's the same as saying 537 minus TF, which is what I put up here. All right, so now it's time to start doing the multiplication. All right, so I'll just multiply the first two numbers, 150 times 0.444. We get 66.6. .6. And what are the units? If I, do the, if I multiply this number times this number, then grams on top, grams on bottom are going to cancel. Grams cancels grams. So then my units for this number now are joules per degree C, the units that are left over here, joules per degree C. So again, let's just do one operation at a time. So I'm going to leave this 537 degrees C minus TF. I didn't do anything to that one yet. And over here, let's just multiply these first two numbers, 200 times 4.184. 836.8 and if I multiply this number times this number grams and grams cancel but I still have joules over degree C so those are my units now for this number joules over degrees C and I haven't touched this other number we'll leave this the same TF minus 25 degrees C all right, so now let's, now this, this next, uh, we've got 
two numbers in parentheses here. So if I have a number on the outside of the parentheses, then I have to distribute this number in. So I have to multiply this number by this, and I have to multiply this number times the other number inside the parentheses. So we'll do 66.6 .6 times 537, and that's 3, 5, 7, 6, 4, point two and if I multiply this number times this number then I have degree C on the top and degree C on the bottom so those cancel so after I multiply these together my unit the units I have left are joules so this becomes joules and I have to multiply it now I'll multiply this number times negative TF so that's going to be negative 66.6 .6 joules per degree C T F I just mul I just add the TF to the end of this this times TF is just negative 66.6 .6 joules per degree C TF alright so now on the other side I'm gonna do this number times TF so that's just 836.8 joules per degree C TF just combine them like I did on the other side and now I have to multiply this times negative 25 degrees C so that's going to be negative 836 times 8 or excuse me 836.8 .8 times 25 equals 2092 and if I multiply this number times this number, degree C and degree C are going to cancel, one on top, one on the bottom. So my units for this number are now joules. So now I have a number minus a number. And over here I have a number minus another number. So now I have to, all I've done so far is just I haven't actually done any algebra, I've just been doing arithmetic and I've multiplied this times this and then I multiplied this times this. So now I've got these two phrases on either side of the equals sign, but I need to get my TFs on the same side. And now I have this phrase, joules, this number over here with joules and this number over here with joules, I need to get those on the same side. So what I should do now is if I have this minus this and I want to get the joules to the other side then I should add right minus 2092 joules plus 2092 joules and whatever you do to one side you have to do to the other so let me move that over here 2092 joules and I want to get this number over here so if I have negative 66.6 .6 joule degree CTF, I need positive 66.6 .6 joule degree CTF. So now I've moved the two 2092 joules over to this side. I'll add these two together. And now I've moved the 66.6 .6 Joule degree C T F over to this side. Because look, these units are the same. That means I can add these two numbers together. And these units are the same. That means I can add these two numbers together. I just have to use algebra and move that value to this side and move that value to this side. So now let's finish. Let's actually do this addition here. All right, 2092 plus 3576.4.2 equals 5684.2 joules. And over here, 836.8 plus 66.6 .6 equals 903.4 
joule degree C per degree C T F equals. So now I have this number equals this number. So close, I think I can fit this all on this one piece, on this one sheet. We only have one more, uh, one more function to go, one more operation to go to solve this. So I need to get TF by itself. And what have I, I've been doing all this math, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to find the final temperature, right? And final temperature is in degree C, right? Well, here's degree C down here. But right now I have joules and joules over degree C and TF. So how do I solve this? How do I finally get this to tell me what the final temperature is going to be? Well, if I want to get TF by itself, then I have to divide both sides. By 903.4 joules per degree C. Divided by 903.4 joules per degree C. So now, after I do this operation, this and this equals 1, so that cancels out. So all I have left on that side is TF. And over here, after I solve this math, see, divide in. We get a line. I can't fit it on one piece of paper. So before I write the answer, let me show you what happens here. So after these, this is. Uh, if I separate this a little bit, remember this here, this number here is really times TF. So when I have a number joules over degree C TF, that's really 836.8 .8 joules over degree C times TF is how I would read that, right? I would multiply this value times this value. So if I separate them, then I have this value times TF. So if I have this divided by this, then that, that equals 1. So all I have left on this side is TF. And on this side, after I divide these, um, joules on top is going to cancel with joules down here in the denominator. So joules and joules get canceled. And degree C is in the denominator, but it's in the denominator of the denominator. So by mathematical magic, this degree C actually goes back into the numerator and that becomes the units for your final answer. So I'm going to bring it back up here to the top. We'll say equals TF, that's what I have left on that side, and the number is 62 point seven four five four degrees C All right because joule and joule got cancelled and degree C is the unit that I have left on this side so after all this math we find that putting a piece of hot coal at 537 degrees C into 200 grams of water at 25 degrees C the temperature of the water increased to 62.7454 degrees C. But of course, I can't keep that answer. There's too many digits. Whenever you have that many digits in an answer, you should be skeptical. So here I have four sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs, uh, three. Actually, that only has one sig fig. What did I say in the previous page? I have 200, oh, four sig figs, so four, three, four, three. It looks like I, my answer should have three sig figs, is my number with the fewest sig figs. So when I round this, one, two, three, then my final answer is 62.7 degrees C. It's the final temperature.
Okay, so um, sometimes it's uh, valuable for us to measure the heat in a chemical reaction. So there's two different ways that we use, two different um, systems that we can use to measure the heat in a system. And we get two different quantities that we're really measuring. So to measure uh, delta E, which remember is the change in internal energy, e is, the, is the, all the potential and kinetic energy in the system. So to measure delta E, delta E is equal to Q plus W, heat plus work. So uh, one way of measuring delta E is, of course, by measuring heat and work. But if we can carry out the measurement in such a way that we know that one of them is zero, like uh, by putting this into a system so that there's no change in volume, because remember, work Q equals mc delta t. Work equals negative p delta v. So if there's no change in temperature, then there's no heat that was transferred. Delta t equals zero, then this whole thing equals zero, right? Because if I multiply something by zero, then it's equal to zero. So down here in work, if delta V, if the change in volume is zero and the volume doesn't change, then delta V is zero and negative P times zero equals zero. So work would be equal to zero. So if I set up a system where the volume doesn't change, then work is equal to zero. Then when I, can't, when I measure the heat in that system, then what I'm really measuring is the total change in the internal energy of the system because delta E equals Q plus W but if I know that W is zero, then delta E equals Q. So um, a system that, is, that we use to, uh, to measure the heat of the system is called a calorimeter, a bomb calorimeter. So in, we can't actually determine the temperature changes of the chemicals themselves. So if I'm trying to figure out what um, the heat is involved in a chemical reaction, Measuring the temperature of the chemicals before and after is actually really hard to do. But we know from our, the example we just looked at that if the, if the heat in a chemical reaction is performed inside of water, for example, like we drop the hot metal in water and the hot metal transfers heat to the water and the water heats up, if I perform a chemical reaction underwater, and the vessel that it's in heats up and then the water heats up, the, the heat that the water gained is exactly equal to the heat that the chemical reaction lost. So I can measure the heat in a chemical reaction by measuring how the water changes, the surroundings, the, the water that's surrounding that chemical reaction. So the, the heat of the system is the negative heat of the surroundings, like the reaction, like the example we just did. So this is what a bomb calorimeter looks like. In a bomb calorimeter, the uh, reactants get put in here. We can perform a chemical reaction in here, or we can um, combust a sample, put a sample in here, and push an ignition wire, which will burn the sample. And when the sample burns, we can see how much energy was in that sample by measuring the, the temperature change in the water. But either way, whether it's a reaction or um, com combustion, just burning something, which I suppose is also a reaction, uh, a reaction with the oxygen, the air that's inside the tube. Um, if this is a very tightly sealed container in here, then when this reaction happens, the volume of the container cannot change because it's very tightly sealed. So if, if delta V equals zero, because in this tightly sealed container, the volume can't change, then there's no work that is performed. So in this setup, we can make work equal to zero. And so the only thing that we're measuring is this reaction happens. It makes the vessel heat up. When the vessel heats up, then the water heats up. When the water heats up, then the thermometer registers that there was a temperature change. And when we know what delta T is, the temperature change, then we can measure Q. Q equals MC delta T. And that's measuring the uh, heat at constant volume.
the volume doesn't change, which gives us the delta E, the total change in internal energy in the system. Enthalpy is another value that we look at sometimes when we're talking about energy. And enthalpy is the sum of the internal energy, which is E, uh, plus the product of P and V, pressure times volume. So enthalpy is a state function. And uh, what that means is we'll actually talk about that more later. That just means that regardless of how you calculate the enthalpy or regardless of the process, um, that you the path that you take to get to the enthalpy it's always the same it doesn't change if you change paths um, the enthalpy change delta H of a reaction is the heat evolved in a reaction at constant pressure so in a bomb calorimeter we're at constant volume but you can imagine if I'm burning something in this bomb calorimeter and I, I burn this sample and it turns into co2 gas and water um, and heat is released, then as that gas is generated, the pressure inside this vessel is going to increase. That's why I have to seal it up really, really tight. Because whenever you burn anything, it increases the pressure and it might explode, right? So although this is a constant volume system, and the volume can't change, it is not a constant pressure system. The pressure can change, and the pressure does change when I, have, when I perform the chemical reaction inside. Um, Enthalpy, on the other hand, if I measure the enthalpy, I'm measuring the heat of a reaction at constant pressure. So in that case, the volume can change. Maybe the lid is not very loose, but the pressure doesn't change. The pressure is constant. So this is all very abstract, I know, but the, what we're saying is there are two different kinds of energy that we can measure if we're trying to measure how much energy there is in a chemical reaction. I can measure delta E, which is the total change in the internal energy, or I can measure delta H, which is the change in enthalpy. Those are very, very similar, and they're very similar in value when I measure both of those for the same chemical reaction. The only difference is when um, where reactions produce a large quantity of gas, then we're talking about um, a value that might be underestimated because that quantity of gas is not able to perform work in this case because delta V is zero. So if we lose a big number a big uh, amount of that energy that we can't calculate in certain conditions then the numbers might be different delta H and delta E might be different so when I'm performing when I want to measure delta E I use a constant volume system and when I want to measure delta H I use a constant pressure system and a constant pressure system is really as simple as what we call a coffee cup calorimeter which is really just as you see here a couple of coffee cups if I perform a reaction inside this system and the lid is not very tight, it's not sealed very tight, then when I perform a reaction, if any gas is generated, the gas can escape through the lid. It just goes right underneath the lid because this is not an airtight seal like it was in the bomb. So if this is not an airtight seal, then the pressure doesn't change. If there's any gas generated, the gas generated just seeps right out. So the pressure inside the system and the pressure outside the system are the same. So this is a constant pressure calorimeter. Um, and again, delta H and delta E are generally very similar unless we're talking about reactions that produce or use a large quantity of gas, in which case that work term is generally under or overestimated. So here's another example question. Let's work on this one. 50 mils of 0.45 molar magnesium hydroxide was mixed with 50 mils of 0.9 molar uh, hydrobromic acid, and the temperature increased from 22.76 degrees C to 27.10 degrees C. If the solution has a density of 1 gram per mil and a heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram per mole, then what is the uh, delta H, what is, this shouldn't be gram per mole, this should be gram per degree C. Then what is the delta H, the change in enthalpy for this reaction? So first we need to determine what kind of reaction we're talking about. So let's write the reactants down. MgOH2 plus HBr. 
Now, how do we determine what's going to happen in a reaction when I mix two things together? Remember from chapter 4, when we're looking at reactants, there's a couple of different ways that they can come together. So this reaction here, if we break this apart into its pieces, magnesium is a 2 plus ion, and I have two hydroxide ions. And HBr, H is plus, and Br is minus. So in this kind of reaction, when I have a plus and a minus and a plus and a minus, the pluses switch places. So what that means is that on this side, I'll have an H plus and an OH minus, and Mg2 plus and Br minus. I just swapped these guys around. So um, what I actually, I forgot the two here, I have two OHs. So if I have two OH minuses, H plus and OH minus makes water. H plus, OH minus, H2O. So if I have two OH minuses, then I need two H pluses. And then I can make H2O. And if I have Mg2 plus and Br1 minus, then I need two Br minus so that I have two minus and two plus. Because remember, the charge must be equal in a reaction. So I have two plus, two minus. One plus, one minus. Two plus, two minus. So that makes this compound Mg. B R two. Two bromines. So if I have two bromines over here, then to balance this reaction, I need two bromines over here, and I need two H's over here, so I need two HBr. So we have to generate, before we can answer a question like this, we have to first generate the equation. What is happening in this reaction? Okay, so next we have to uh, figure out what is delta H for this reaction. So delta H equals Q at constant pressure. So what is Q? Q equals M C delta T. So we have delta T, right? Here's a temperature, here's a temperature. So we have a temperature change. We have delta T. C, we have a heat capacity. Here's C. We don't have M. We have volume. We have molarity. So how can I turn this into M? Because I need M in order to calculate Q. So um, remember what big M means. 0 0.450 molar is 0 0.450 moles per liter. So if I have 50 mils, and I convert negative three liter milliliters to liters. And this says I have 50 mils of this molarity, and this is really moles per liter. And I have 0 0.450 moles per liter. then I can figure out how many moles I have of this first substance. So I can do that for this other one too. We have, this is for magnesium hydroxide. And for HBr, we do the same thing, 50 mils 
times convert this to liters 10 to the negative 3 liter per milliliter and HBR it says I have 0.9 moles per liter so if I do this then I'm gonna get moles or mils converted to liters and liters converted to moles so this will tell me how many moles of each of these I have so that's still not quite uh, mass but we're getting closer because that's part of delta H. Delta H is going to be joules per mole or sometimes kilojoules per mole. So to determine delta H I'm going to need to know the joules and how many moles there are. Alright so so we've used almost all these pieces of information now. I've got uh, we've used this and this and this and this and we haven't put this quite in there yet but we know what we're gonna do with Delta T we know what we're gonna do with C why is it giving us the density here what do we do with the density of a solution the density says that this solution has one gram per milliliter well we know how many milliliters we have we have if I mix this and I mix, mix these together then I have 50 plus 50 100 milliliters so if the density says that the solution is one gram per milliliter and I have a hundred milliliters then that means I have a hundred grams so 100 mils times one gram per mil equals 100 grams so here is my mass right so a question like this it's asking us to solve for the enthalpy delta H delta H equals Q a constant pressure so Q equals MC delta T so delta H is just another name for Q it's the same thing the only difference between delta H and Q is that sometimes when we solve Q, we're left with just joules like we were in the last, uh, when we, actually I guess we didn't solve for joules in the last example. But sometimes when we solve for Q and we put in mass and C and delta T, we're left with joules. And when we do, when we solve for delta H, we have to do one more step and we have to have joules divided by moles or kilojoules divided by moles. So delta H is just another name for Q. You're calculating it the same way. So let's get to it and calculate this. I'm going to get rid of this here, give ourselves some room. Now we have 100 grams. So Q equals MC delta T. Q equals 100 grams times C, 4.184 joules per gram per degree C, times the temperature change. And this says the temperature increased from this to this. So what's the final temperature? 27.1 degrees C, minus the initial temperature, 22.76 degrees C. So here's what my equation looks like. So let's just start multiplying these across like we did in the last one. 100 times 4.184 equals 418.4. Gram and gram gets canceled. So the units here are joules per degree C. I didn't do anything to this yet. 2.76 degrees C. All right, now we'll have to distribute. I multiply this by this number, and I multiply this by this number. So times 27.1 Q equals 1133.6. Four. and 
when I multiply this by this, degree C and degree C get canceled, so the units here are joules, minus this number times this number. So 418.4 times 22.76 nine five two two point seven eight four and when I multiply this number by this number degree C and degree C cancels so this is joules okay so now do this last one three three point eight three three eight point six four joules and let's see sig figs three sig figs three sig figs four sig figs looks like I should have three so five says to round up so this becomes 182 zero joules 1820 joules so Remember, to calculate delta H, I need to know joules per mole, or kilojoules per mole. So, let's see how many moles we have here. I have 50 milliliters times one thousandth times 0.45. This equals 0 0.0225 moles of magnesium hydroxide. And down here I have 50 times 1,000th times 0.9. Here I have 0 0.045 moles of HBr. So how many moles of water do I have? Well, according to the stoichiometry, it takes one mole of magnesium hydroxide and two moles of hydrobromic acid to make two moles of water. So how many moles of water did I make if I have this many moles of magnesium hydroxide and this many moles of hydrobromic acid? Well, I can't make any more than my uh, limiting reagent. So let's, we have to, I ran out of room here. So let's figure out my limiting reagent on the next page. 0 0.0225 moles of magnesium hydroxide. 0.045 moles of HBr and we're trying to figure out how which of these is our limiting reagent by seeing how much water I can make so there's one mole of magnesium hydroxide for every two moles of H2O according to my balanced equation and there's oops two moles of HBr for every two moles of H2O. So I can make 0 0.045 moles of H2O and 0 0.045 moles of H2O. So it's the same amount, 0 0.045 moles of H2O, because it takes twice as much HBr as it does magnesium hydroxide. I have half as much magnesium hydroxide, but it takes twice as much of the HBr, so I can make the same amount of water.
So finally, now I know heat, Q equals MC delta T, and I know moles, so delta H equals Q divided by moles. So my heat is eighteen hundred and twenty. Oh, but here is an important consideration. In this reaction, did the water heat up or did it cool down? The water heated up, which means that the reaction released energy. And if the re reaction releases energy, it releases heat, then we say that that heat is negative. And if a reaction absorbs heat, then we say that that heat is positive. So the sign of Q is relative to whether that heat was being released in the reaction or whether it was being absorbed. And since the temperature increased, then the heat was being released. So this is negative 1,820 joules divided by 0.045 moles. equals negative 40,444 joules per mole. And sometimes this is um, reported in kilojoules. So this would be negative 40.4 kilojoules per mole. Delta H. So there's really two parts to a problem like this. The first part is Q. Q equals MC delta T. We have to find the mass and the C and the temperature change. And to, del to calculate delta H, I also need to know the moles. So in order to know how many moles of water are being made, I need to know what the reaction looks like. So I have to put these two reagents together and see what the reaction looks like. I have to balance the reaction. And then I have to perform stoichiometry to see how many moles of substance I'm actually going to make. So then I do, I do the Q part separately and the mole part separately, and then you bring them together, Q over moles. And that gives you your delta H, the change in enthalpy.